I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain. tuning in. Glad you're tuning in to worship the Lord and also to hear the word of God. May God's word richly strengthen you and bless you. Please join me for prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for these moments that we can come before you and turn our hearts towards you. We ask that you will open our hearts, that you will give us understanding, that your spirit will move within us, that we may know you and know you better each day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, prepare me be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. Join me for confession and absolution. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Amen. Upon this your confession, I have averged my office as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first reading is taken from Amos, the fifth chapter, beginning at the 10th verse. There are those who hate the one who upholds justice in court and detest the one who tells the truth. You levy a straw tax on the poor and impose a tax on their grain. Therefore, though you have built stone mansions, you will not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. I know how many are your offenses and how great your sins. There are those who oppress the innocent and take bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Therefore, the prudent keep quiet in such times, for the times are evil. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you, just as you say he is. Hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Hebrews, the third chapter, beginning at the 12th verse. See to it, brothers and sisters, 
that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. And as has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who had rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is recorded in St. Mark, the 10th chapter, beginning at the 17th verse. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he called. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Greetings, so glad you're tuning in. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Share the video with a friend, a family member. I pray God's word will open your hearts and your minds that you will have a deeper understanding of the God that we believe in. Uh, let's begin. A company once hired a new CEO and wanted the, uh, wanted the company to go in a very different direction. Now, when the, first, when the CEO came on board, the first thing he wanted to do was to get rid of all the slackers in the company. And so during a tour of the facilities, he came across a man. He noticed this young man was leaning against the wall, and he was doing nothing. Not only was he doing nothing, he was, uh, uh, he was picking his teeth. And so, and so the CEO decided to ask the man, how much money do you make in a week? A little surprised, the man looked at him and said, I make $500 a week, and why? Well, at that moment, the CEO wanted to, wanted to make sure people knew that he meant business. And so he told the guy to wait a moment. And so he, went, so he went to his office, and when he came back, he handed the man $2,000, and then he said, here is a month's pay. Now get out and don't come back. Wow. This was the entire room of employees watched this happen. And the man who received the envelope of money, and he left, but he left with a smile. Well, the CEO was feeling pretty good about himself uh, because he felt like he made a point to air all the employees in the company. And so suddenly, he asked a question, does anyone, can anyone tell me what, what that goofball did here? So there was a room from across there was a voice from across the room that said, sure, he was, the, he was the pizza delivery guy. He was just waiting to collect his money. All right. Our gospel lesson today deals with a CEO figure, a CEO during the time of Jesus. Now, the man had lived a very remarkable life. Um, in Mark chapter 10, verse 17, it says Jesus started on his way. Jesus was on the road, ready to get on the road. A man ran up to him, fell on his knees before him. 
Good teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Then verse 20, teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. Wow, he seemed to have a lot going on for him in his life. I mean, a lot of good things going on. I mean, the book of Matthew, Matthew talks about the same account, and he gives us the detail that this man was young. And so he had a, his life right in front of him. He was young. In, in addition, the book of Luke adds a detail that he was a ruler. That is, he, was, he ruled the synagogue. He was a synagogue ruler. He was in charge. And so he was young. He was influential. Uh, the, the community looked up to him. Um, he was a leader. And then our text from Mark tells us that he was rich. So you have rich, young, influential, I mean, this guy was the full package. He had everything. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with being rich. I mean, oftentimes we hear, we've heard people teach that, oh, in order to be a follower of Jesus, you must be poor, which is not true because this is only one of all the stories in the Bible where Jesus tells the man, to sell all of his possessions and follow him. This is the only story. In fact, if you look at the story of Zacchaeus, he was a rich, he was a rich man. Even though he was a tax collector, Jesus never asked him to sell all of his possessions. And so there's nothing wrong with having money. Money is not the root of all evil. It is the love of money that is the root of evil. So, so having money isn't the problem. It is when money has you that is the problem. So not only this, this, was this guy uh, rich, not only was he a ruler, not only was he young, he had everything. He was also a good man. I mean, think about it, when he, when he met with Jesus, he told Jesus, I mean, he lived a moral life. He said, I kept all the commandments. I honor my father and mother. I don't commit adultery. I don't steal. I don't, I don't lie. I don't defraud others. He's a good guy. In addition, not only was he very, a moral person, but he was very religious. In fact, he was a ruler of a synagogue. I mean, they would not pick him as the ruler of the synagogue had he not had a heart for the people and a heart for worship. In fact, he respected uh, the, Jesus and treated him like a distinguished rabbi. He called him good teacher. Not only did he call him good teacher, he was very genuine when he came before Jesus. He knelt before Jesus. So he was religious as well. I mean, he was the full packet, you know? You know, if, if there were young women back then, they really, there were, they looked up to him and said he would be somebody that was husband material. For young men or, or boys growing up, they would look at this guy and say, I wanna be like him. But friends, our idea of good is very different from God's idea. From the outside, this guy looked like he, was a, he had everything going for him. From the outside, everything looked good. But from deep within, he was yearning for something more. He knew something was missing. And that's why he went to Jesus and said, good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus responds by saying, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God. 
So notice the sincerity in his asking. Notice that he really wanted to know. So he comes to Jesus, good teacher, what did you do to inherit eternal life? Can you tell me so I can do the same and, and inherit eternal life? But Jesus' answer is, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And so that leads to my first point for today. God alone is good. Now, what does that mean? Well, God is, God is good. He is right. He is true. He is good. His intentions are always good. There's no evil. His motivation is good. His plan for us is always good, even if we don't understand it. In the book of Genesis, during creation, he proclaimed that all of creation was good. In Psalm 100, verse 5, the psalmist writes, The Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So not only is, is he good, but that definition of good also involves perfection. So God, only God alone, is good and perfect. Maybe some of you are like in the same situation as the young man we just talked about. Maybe, you know, you may not have the riches or the money that he has, but you have a car, you have a house, you have a family, I mean, you have a job. You might even be donating to the poor. You volunteer to help your community. You treat your neighbor well. I mean, you're considered a good person. But the problem is that our definition of good is not the same as God's definition. God's definition of good also involves perfection. So that's why Jesus says no one is good except God alone. St. Paul wrote, for all have sinned and fall short the glory of God. No human being will ever be good enough before God. Let's take it a step further. Maybe you even say you're like that. You, maybe you're, you're, you even say you're baptized or you attend a church. Maybe you even serve at the church. But for some of you, deep down inside, you feel that there's something missing. My friends, I want to say to you, religion is not good enough. It's not enough for you. You must have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, going back to the core question, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, what did you do? Tell me, how did you do it so I can do it as well? Jesus looked at him and loved him. He loved on him. Then he said, one thing you lack. And interesting is the, the book of Matthew adds that word perfection. If you want to be perfect, then he says, go sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven then come follow me. Whoa. The second point I want to make is eternal life cannot be earned. Now, why did Jesus tell him to do that? Well, that one thing he lacked was very important to him because he, was a, he loved his money. He loved his wealth. He loved his, he loved his possessions. And so Jesus was trying to show him that eternal life cannot be earned. We cannot do, we cannot keep the law. There's no way we can be good enough with our efforts to ever make it to heaven. The man broke the first commandment which says, you shall have no other gods before me. His wealth became his God. In fact, because of our inability, St. Paul echoes Romans 3.20. He writes, For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. And since through the law comes knowledge of sin, 
So Jesus was trying to point out the fallacy of his thinking. So go sell all of your possessions. Give it to the poor and come follow me. If you can do that. Well, he couldn't. He's trying to point out that you cannot earn eternal life. It's impossible. We can't do it. You can't do it. Martin Luther, the great reformer, fell into the same situation. In fact, if you remember, um, he, he was riding back to the University of Wittenberg where he encountered a, a lightning storm. Well, lightning almost hit him. And so, he, and so right away, he, he burst out a prayer to St. Anne, and he promised that he would be a monk. Well, he did. He, sold, he gave all of his possessions away. However, he, he still didn't feel that he, was, that he earned eternal life. In fact, he became a monk and lived aesthetic lifestyle. He dedicated himself to following the law, trying to be good. But every time he did this, he still felt that there was something missing. He wasn't good enough. He began fasting. He began praying for many long hours. He even starved himself, beat himself. And there are times his comrades found him unconscious in a pool of his own blood. He went to confession often. And one time he was there for six hours. Even the priests got tired of him. They felt that he had too much time on his hands. Friends, St. James chapter 2, verse 10 says, for whoever keeps the whole law that fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. What St. James is pointing out to us is you, you can keep nine, nine of the Ten Commandments, but that's still not perfection, not good enough. You can keep 99 of the rules in the Bible, 99 out of 100, still not good enough. God, the gold standard is 100%. The gold standard is perfection. In order to be good, you must be perfect. Finally, my last point is, eternal life is a gift from God. Romans, in Romans chapter 3, verse 22 to 24, notice Paul says, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. It means all people, for all have sinned and fall short the glory of God. All of us have fallen short of God's definition of good. That's the bad news. No one is perfect enough or good enough to be admitted to heaven. Then comes the good news, verse 24. And all are justified freely by his gift through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So because of God's grace, we are all justified or declared without sin, declared without sin freely, or that word justified means made perfect, came as a result of Jesus Christ, who paid the price with his death and resurrection. Eternal life is a gift of God that is to be received. John 3.16, the gospel in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So it's about believing in Jesus, then you'll have eternal life. And then verse 17 talks about the... Uh, the intention, the motivation behind it. For God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And see, my dear friends, eternal life is a gift from God. Let me just bring this to a close here. There's a missionary uh, in India named uh, David Morse. Now, David... Neva had a friend, that, um, uh, an Indian, an older Indian uh, pearl diver that he had been trying, he had been witnessing to. 
and trying to bring him into the kingdom. Well, he's as a diver, a, a pearl diver, he was, this man was very um, versed in pearls. And so David took the opportunity to talk to him about pearls, the pearly gates of heaven. And he told, Dave, and he told his, his buddy Ram, if you ever wanted to see the pearly gates of heaven, those 12 gates, you must believe in Jesus Christ. And then he also said to him, you must make plans for your eternity. You must prepare for your life to come. His friend Ram replied, that's just what I'm going to do. But what he's talking about is he's talking about a Hindu's pilgrimage, which involves walking bare feet, kneeling down and kissing the road. That's his Hindu way of making it to heaven because his friend Ram did not understand and would not receive the free gift offered through Jesus Christ. Then one afternoon, something changed. One afternoon, Ram invited David over to his house. When he came over to his house, he brought, he brought to him a box, a heavy box. He said, I've had this box for years. There's only one thing I ever keep in it, and I'm gonna tell you about it. He said, I once had a son, and the man's, Ram's eyes began to water. He said, my son was a diver too. He was the very best. He had a quest. He wanted to find one of the biggest and rarest pearls in the entire world, and he did find one. Unfortunately, unfortunately, he was down under too long, and he gave his life finding this one pearl. Ever since then, he had kept this pearl with him and in this box for many years. And so, he began shaking. He says, all these years I've kept this pearl, but now I'm going, referring to the pilgrimage, not to return and not to return and to you, my dear friend, I'm giving you this pearl. When he opened the box, it was the most beautiful, one of the biggest pearls in the world. His friend, his, the missionary David was just blown away he looked at it and he said, I cannot accept this. Let me buy it from you. I'll give you a thousand rupees. Ram said, no, no man in all the world has enough money to pay for what the pearl is worth to me. On the market, a million rupees would not buy this pearl. I will not sell it. You may only have it, David, as a gift. His friend said, no, no, I cannot accept it. I must work for it, I must pay for it. But this friend Ram said, you don't understand. You see, my son gave his life to get this pearl. I wouldn't sell it for any money. Its worth is in the lifeblood of my son. I cannot sell this, but permit me to give it to you and accept it as a token of love, love I have for you. At that moment, it is as if the Holy Spirit had worked, that as if the Holy Spirit had, had brought a light into the room. Right away, David gripped the hand of his buddy Ram, said, Ram, this is what you have been saying to God. He's offering you eternal life as a free gift. It is so great and priceless that no man on earth can buy it. No man on earth can earn it. No man is good enough to deserve it. It cost the lifeblood of his only son to make the entrance for you into heaven. In a hundred pilgrimage, you cannot earn that entrance. All you can do is accept it as a token of God's love to you, a sinner. At that moment, suddenly it made sense to him. Ram said, I will accept this. And then David says, I will accept this pearl in deep humility but won't you too accept God's great gift of eternal life and deep humility knowing that it cost him the death of his son to offer it to you? At that moment, tears ran down Ram's face. 
the old message, I see. I see now. I understand now. I believe Jesus gave himself for me. I accept him. St. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 8-9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Eternal life is a gift from God to be received. And so, my dear friends, no one is ever on this planet, no one is good enough according to God's definition. God alone is good. Second, eternal life cannot be earned. We're never, ever going to be good enough. Number three, eternal life is a gift from God. Will you accept this gift? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? It's not about doing. It is about receiving the gift that God has for us through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Join me for prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanksgiving. We thank you for your great love for all of us. We thank you for giving us eternal life as a gift that all we have to do is to believe in your son, Jesus Christ, who suffered and died on a cross for us. Lord, we thank you for the promise of eternal life. We thank you for the promise of forgiveness. Lord, at this time, we remember all those victims in Florida and along the East Coast, Lord. We ask that you will have mercy upon them and that your mighty hand will act and that you will move the storms elsewhere. Lord, we also ask that you will provide aid through our government, through other resources, through volunteers, through generous donors. Provide for those who, are, who have ex suffered extreme loss. Comfort those who are hurting. Comfort those who have lost family. Lord, move our hearts with compassion and watch over the, those in Florida. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and a power, and a glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen.
Thank you.